welcome to SistraCast, the Sistra podcast for the UK and Ireland. My name's Holly Wallace and I am a mental health first aider and wellbeing champion here at Sistra. My guest today is James. Hi James, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Um, James will be discussing his mental health and specifically covering a time in his life when he came close to taking his own life. So please be aware that this episode may be triggering for some listeners. World Suicide Prevention Day takes place on the 10th of September each year and myself and Wellness at Sistra are incredibly grateful to James for agreeing to take part in this podcast to raise awareness and remove the stigma surrounding suicide. The way in which we talk about suicide really matters. The latest figures from the Office for National Statistics state that men represent three quarters of UK suicide and that each year one in five of us think about suicide in our lifetimes. Having suicidal thoughts doesn't mean that someone has a mental illness, but there is a connection between mental ill health and suicidal thoughts. And that's something we're going to be covering in our podcast today. James, great to have you here. I've known you professionally and personally for quite a number of years now, and I suppose that whilst I was aware of some of the things you were going through, I probably didn't know the full extent. And I think that is often the case with mental ill health. We keep it hidden, we put on a smile, we say we're fine. At, at what point did you think, actually, I'm not fine? Was there a starting point for that? Yeah, there was really. And um, just to add on to the smile part, the, I, I do believe that the art of depression is knowing how to fake a smile very well because you, you, the anxiety side of it, you don't want people to know, you know, yeah. so you, you, you do put on a very convincing fake smile. Still, a lot of people today don't know I actually suffer. Um, but I think it was probably about halfway through my journey when I was uh, in my early 20s. It was after the attempt and I realised this is normal. And I was uh, dragged into a room by a friend, colleague and friend Claire uh, Nightingale and got dragged me into a room with you and so he's yeah. having anxiety attacks in the middle of the office and from there had I you, decided to spoken, get help. Had you spoken to anyone before that, you know, because obviously you get to that point where somebody, you've got a colleague who is concerned about your mental health, mm. that you must have been showing, you know, some signs. Do you think... How do, how do you think she could tell? Were you, were you quite open with her or could were there things, you know, you maybe were extra tired or all those kind of warning signs? We Do you think that was taking place? I don't know, uh, because for, for a lot of my uh, teens and, and growing up, I'd, I'd struggled with emotions and I'd, I'd bought my emotions up. And uh, I just a lot of the time thought, well, this is just who I am. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I, have, I have good days, I have bad days. I, I can't control my emotions some days I'm, I'm really down and you know tired and another days I'm really charismatic my normal self I'd say um and I've always been very overly compassionate caring yeah. about other people and, and making sure they were okay before myself um yeah. but it's it, it was just continuous the 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 anxiety attacks and and I just thought what what's happening you know and I ended up branching out to Claire and she kind of like was just like yeah this isn't okay you need to go talk to someone and get help it's time you know and it kind of went on from there and I went through life works and started seeing counsellors and yeah. got back on the right track I think started taking um spoke to my GP and got put on antidepressants yeah and started climbing out the pit yeah I suppose there's um you know, as, as well as the kind of anxiety that you can go through often when you are struggling um, with mental ill health, there's the physical symptoms as well. It can manifest, can't it? Do you know, I know if I'm having a really stressful week, I'll get a really sore top of my tummy. And it's, so it's not just the, the the stress and anxiety, you know, there's the the kind of other symptoms that, that will come along. Um, and you know the the panic attacks are just sort of one part of it um how did how did going to a, a counselor help i mean did what we were, were you able to sort of open up and talk to them um did they help you you said you were like bottling things up did that process help you to to find coping mechanisms i mean it was what kind of was it talking therapy was it cbt i think you said you you'd been for initial counseling and then you went for some later on what was that first counselling session like so my first counselling session was 
I got sent to mind in York, and as, as as helpful as it was, it also wasn't very helpful um, compared to the counselling I've had recently. So the first set of counselling, it was a lot of <clears throat> talking and, and moaning about my life and this, that and the other, um, talk about my history from getting raised from childhood and having childhood depression and then um, not being able to uh, manage my emotions, getting very upset with my parents' divorce, deciding having to pick which parent to go to to the point that they sort the schedule out to make it easier on me, wow. you know. Um, and then I've I've also dealt with a lot of death in my life. Yeah. I think at the moment I've been to seven or eight funerals for, you know, to say I'm only 28, that's quite a lot. Yeah. So that, and I, yeah. Um, sorry, it just made sorry. me, um, sorry, it just made me very... Um, hard to deal with my emotions and deal with grief you know yeah and they say actually you know if you go to sort of mental health um uk.org you know the kind of risk factors in terms of um having suicidal ideations you know that you've got sociological economical psychological but they can include those difficult life events such as kind of um you know the trauma if a loved one dies or you know a life-changing mm. event such as a relationship ending and i'm guessing that those kind of things were the things that that were, were triggers for you that pushed you towards having the kind of suicidal ideations. Can you tell me a little bit more about when those feelings began? Um, I couldn't actually tell you. I had I had them in secondary school. You know, I was walking down the street and thinking, do you know what happens if I just end it now? Stand in front of this bus that's passing yeah. me. You know, and I was just like, just behave, carry yeah. on walking. You know, or or. We, when it got to the point of uh, hating myself mm -hmm. and, and and being sick and tired of the hate, you know, and you got to bear in mind, some days I didn't think about it. It wasn't there. You know, the, uh, yeah. depression, the depression wasn't in the back of my head. I see, I see depression as a, a little storm cloud at the back of your head and sometimes it's a, it's a pinprick and sometimes you're struggling yeah. for it to not completely take over and lose all rational thought. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some days I was absolutely fine. Some days I was I was self-harming you know um right, okay. and i was hiding it you know i was i wasn't obvious i did it in places where no one would see no one knows yeah. a lot of people don't know i self-harmed mm. and then it got to the point where i, I, I will admit i had a bit of a drink and obviously drink can either make things worse or a lot better another and, another risk factor isn't it yeah just like yeah. misusing drugs and alcohol puts you yeah. at higher risk I, I did a lot of drinking you know just to try and feel some sort of happiness it, it yeah. did a 180 and um i found myself stood next to the river in york about to jump in sending goodbye text messages to my best friends didn't want to talk to my family about it just my best friends saying goodbye sort sort my stuff out when i'm gone i love you but i can't i can't deal with this any longer i'm done feeling being in pain i just want to be in peace and quiet and and then my phone died mm -hmm. and the compassionate logical side of my brain took back over and it was just like what are you doing yeah you stupid human being like how would you feel if somebody you knew committed suicide how much damage and and trauma would you cause your best friends your family mm. that would devastate me and i, I couldn't i couldn't deal with deal with that I couldn't do that to another human being I couldn't hurt them like I was about to hurt everybody else in my life so I, I basically ran home Stepped and away, yeah. yeah and charged my phone up called them back and, and so to speak my, my language got a bollocked <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know um yeah. they, were, they were crying I've, these are the friends that I've had since childhood that I've never had cry and they were sobbing down the phone doing what on earth do you think you're doing but then it kind of went quiet after that. I didn't do anything mm. about it. It was just a, you know, a little blip. I had a bit to drink and nothing else came of it, you know. Yeah, so it wasn't like a major turning point. It, it kind of happened and then suddenly it was, you know, what Life what carries next? on. Just, well, life, life carries yeah. on. You'd think yeah. of that as being such a, a huge and major thing, mm. you know, and the impact that it has on you and your friends and family. What what did you do after that? I mean, did was there just this kind of quiet period of of you know kind of going well, what next? Do you know, or I imagine those thoughts. At, you know, at this point, 
I went back to the doctors and got the medication change thinking like I'm I was on sexualine and like every six weeks I was having another mental breakdown after the next mm. mental breakdown and um I, I just kept on getting put on different medication and it kept on changing until I got my I doctor got, got fed up. Find, yeah, and you've got to find the medication that works for you, don't yeah, you? Yeah, he put me on uh, metrezepine because I also wasn't sleeping. Metrezepine doubles as a uh, sleeping tablet. Yeah. As as well as a, a mental health medication, mm. which which did a lot for me. You know, I felt like a zombie half at the time, but I, the mental, as a lot of people know, med, mental health medication or happy pills, as a lot of people call them, they stunt your uh, emotional worth. Mm -hmm. So you can work through your trauma and medication yeah, and figure out what's gone wrong and how to fix it. And then for a lot of people stay on medication, but ideally you need to come off it, mm -hmm. you know. So that's that's what I did. I went on my trezepine and worked my way through it and went for counselling. And my counsellor basically said, you know, it's, it's depression, anxiety through grief, mm -hmm. which was kind of right, but. Now, now I'm older and know more and had more counselling and know about myself. I, I realised that was just a very small factor of my mental health issues. Yeah, I um, think um, what was interesting you said to me earlier when you said you know you'd have these thoughts early on and they pop in your head and pop out and you go, "Don't be silly." That can sometimes almost be um, like an OCD, like obsessive compulsive. Do you know where you you can't like once you start having those thoughts and it's that you know is this a serious ideation or is it just like my brain in overdrive because one of the mm. things you told me was um your adhd diagnosis and that didn't come until a lot later did it no i got that uh two years ago year ago yeah and, and that's that's when a lot of things fell in place um because as i know now a lot of my mental health comes from misdiagnosis of adhd mm -hmm. which is what can happen when you don't get diagnosed for a very long time it happens with uh, autism and females mm -hmm. um you, you don't get diagnosed you don't understand who you are why you feel the way you feel how why you're different to everybody else why you're not motivated or this that and the other um and and depression and anxiety sets in whereas as a lot of people don't understand this that there's this when you say our oh, adhd well he's not adhd he's not hyperactive jumping off you know bouncing off the walls chucking chairs at people yeah. you know well there isn't there's three types of adhd right okay there's hyperactive there's innovative mm -hmm. and then there's a combination of both right most people have a combination of both it's very rarely that you just have one you have days where it's be hyperactive and bouncing off the wall and then other days you're seen as very lazy not doing anything you know so I, I was primarily diagnosed with um innovative so that's very no motivation at all mm -hmm. tired all the time can't be bothered to do with this can't be bothered to do with that you enjoy your own company you know you, you that's just what it is and and a lot of that was sitting back and thinking wow look at all these side effects of adhd mm. so we're talking about adhd um and obviously sometimes it can just result in that kind of adhd paral paralysis it's almost like we were talking about lack of motivation you know it's a bit like a rabbit in headlights isn't it you know fight or flight and or you just kind of so overwhelmed with what you've got to do that you don't do anything yeah exactly I when I finish work, I have to go downstairs and tidy up the entire house, get the kids sorted, get the kids dinner sorted. Yeah. They should do everything I need to get done as an adult before I sit down, because as soon as I sit down, I'm done for the rest of the day. Yeah. My wife can say, oh, well, the bathroom needs painting. And I'm like, no, not a chance. Yeah. My it's body's hard. shut yeah. down, you know. But it's known, like you said earlier, what's you and what's a byproduct of the ADHD. And also, I know you struggle with dyslexia as well. When we were preparing yeah. for this podcast, and I'm not sure if you noticed, you sent me an email to say, so here are some points as discussed, but instead you put as disguised. <laughs> and I know oh, that when, no. you've been, <laughs> when you've been working recently, you said you'd um, 
you'd been working on a drawing and it meant to be a retaining wall and you'd put training wall and then copied yeah. and pasted that kind of 16 times into all the yeah. documents and it well, just that, must be quite difficult yeah. to kind of yeah because with dyslexia i get told like, oh, well, just use spell check i can't yeah. use spell check because yeah. in my mind that's spelled correctly yeah i've spelled it how it sounds but i get like like uh blindness to the words that i'm writing down and you know and it can be embarrassing you can either get embarrassed and go back into your pit of depression and despair or you can just laugh about it that, that's yeah. that's literally yeah. all you can do it's all you can and do isn't it don't get me wrong like the, the adhd is me is who i am yeah it's it's just about how i can get help to cope, be- cope better and become more of a um normal human being in this world of mixtures of you know everything <laughs> How's it how's it been with your team? You know, so obviously you're very open about your struggles and your mental health issues. How's that been at Sistra? Do you have like a wellness plan in place or is it just something, you know, I think there are wellness plans, aren't there, where you can write down, mm-hmm. you know, these are the sort of warning signs if, if you know, and, and, and you'll have that greater understanding. How has that been um in terms of them understanding what, very you, good. what you go through? Brilliant. Very good. Um my issue is, is I've I've been here for eight years now, mm. and I've been born with ADHD, so I've gotten this far with it. So mm. there's there's not much I can really change, apart from just understanding more. But um, my uh, team leader, Mike Jones, basically just sat me down with Stuart Bedder and uh, well-being, and we just with HR, and we, we talked about what symptoms I have and and how how we can make life easier for me. Yeah, and and. When I told my dad this, he panicked and was like, oh, are you stupid, you know. Yeah. They're gonna, they're, they're, they could fire you, you know. It's like, well, no, because I, I believe my company are doing the right, will do the right thing. Yeah. And they have. You know, when I first got started coming down with anxiety attacks, that's why I didn't tell anybody, because I just thought I was just being stupid. But You worry, when, when... you worry that you're going to get the sack, do you know what I mean? And Yeah, exactly. It's... You know, are people going to think you're lazy or you yeah, know, you've yeah. had, if you've had six times off sick because of depression or anxiety, it's going to trigger a, a sort of HR, you know, disciplinary, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. But, but people have to realise there's kind of shades of, you know, there's understanding there. Um, within that's why the we're being so, yeah. so open about it within the business. So everyone knows that it is OK to get help. Yeah. We know we know that depression and anxiety doesn't just affect your mental well-being it affects your immune system it affects everything like i can go through years of being absolutely fine and i can go through months of being sick or poorly five times in a week different illnesses you know because it just attacks your mental mental well-being as well as your physical well-being because i think <clears> you told me again previously you were going to have some time off you know and it originally it was going to mm-hmm. be three weeks it it ended up being three months didn't it yeah well i i originally planned i just I, last year my mum passed away um and i started getting counseling again <clears throat> which was completely different to the first time she came with her uh, coping strategies polyvagal theory which is very good it's about the um your entire body with the primal instincts of fight or flight and how trauma and depression can trigger those instincts which it's all about learning about why you feel the way you're feeling in the moment and calming yourself down with meditation and breathing and taking that next step forward into instead of five steps backwards that that really helps and it was coming up to my mum's um anniversary and i was like right i i need time off work i need i need to sort put something on pause in my life to try and get my adhd under control come back into work with this new routine and then i'll be better for it so that's what i did i spoke to my boss um i was quite surprised that i was very open with it and i was just like this is what i want to do just how i want to get better um and he was just like yeah great you know let's get a well-being plan in place get your return to work in place and go from there and that's what we did but it was like my body was being put on hold mm. for the entire year struggling with my mum and grief and um my body got put on hold and, and as soon as i got that first day of leave my body just went Bleh. yeah all yeah. my mental health came out 
I've never you've been, been holding it up. together. Yeah, you hold, exactly. You, often, you know, I know it's a terrible <clears> analogy, but you find, you know, sometimes when you go on annual leave for two weeks, you know, you think you're going to have a brilliant two weeks off. And then that's the time when all the nasties and the bugs attack you because you've allowed exactly. yourself, you've allowed yourself yeah. to relax. You've given yourself permission, at which point you suddenly, that's it. You just, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and no, I was I was really that. There was a couple of days that I did, I can't remember what happened that day because the depression just completely took over, and I couldn't think with rational thought. And my my wife was petrified and called my dad over, and she, my dad had to come over and was just like, "Come on, let's let's sort you out." And got me back on the street. And now I went back on medication. Mm-hmm. Um, I I was not necessarily just the intrusive thoughts of suicide, but I was I was thinking an exit strategy out of how I would do it. Um, so it got really bad for three months and I was having mental breakdowns and, and all sorts. It was really bad. Um, and obviously the uh, compassion side of it came back in. So I can't leave my dad, I can't leave my kids without a parent. How would I feel? And I couldn't do that to another human being again. And that's that kind of the light at the end of the tunnel, as far yeah. as it was, kind of kept me going. And, I, and eventually the, the ADHD kicked in as well and I didn't want to go back to work. Um, but I finally got back, kicked, my wife basically kicked my butt out the door and got me back into work <laughs> and I needed that distraction and that really helped me and I got yeah. back off medication, I was only on the medication for two and a half months wow. um, and I, I feel uh, tons better for it but you know three yeah. weeks turned into three months which is was not the plan. No, um, I suppose one, one of the things I wanted to mention is you know when you say you started to go into a dark place again um, you know, and your dad came around and kicked you. But I think one of the things that we're taught as mental health first aiders um, is not to shy away from suicide, is to approach it directly. You know, if you suspect somebody is is um, having suicidal ideations, to ask outright to say, have you been thinking about taking your own life? And to not only ask outright, but to, to then take it that step further and then say, you know, have you thought about ways in which you would do it? Because then you're kind of gathering this the seriousness of, of the situation definitely did, did anyone ever approach you to directly ask you you know on the suicide point of view mm. n- no i i told my wife which yeah. you know scared the hell out of her mm-hmm. um but i said you know it's, it's okay i'm not you know not gonna do that to you and i'm not gonna do that to kids yeah um what would you what would you say to somebody what what you know what advice would you give to somebody who maybe you know is listening to this and is in that dark place it does not matter if your heels at the edge of the ledge you're about to do the final jump you can always take a step back there's always someone even though it's so cloudy and foggy and you feel like the world hates you and your best friend doesn't like you as much as you really do and your family don't like you as much as you really do there is someone always someone in your life who does care who does love you to be how you feel like you deserve to be loved there is always that person you just need to take the first step of asking for help and those people will come forward because when i did everybody who i thought you know weren't true friends or weren't true this weren't true that they oh, bust over me like a puppy in a you know new household yeah. you know um that is so really th- th- there is always there is always yeah. someone willing to go the extra mile to make sure you're okay yeah you just need to take that first step because nobody can help you through this apart from you yeah yeah no no amount of talking to or saying you need to get help you need to do this that doesn't matter because at the end of the day, you're going to ignore that. So the only person that is going to help you through this time is yourself. So do yourself the favour of taking that first step of getting help through work, through your GP, as awful as they are at the moment. Um, even <laughs> just even just a close friend who you consider emotional bin bag. James, I th- I think on that note, I think we'll um, we'll finish this podcast. But I just want to say wow it has been so brilliant talking to you you've been so open i really hope that people listen to this you know and it and it, it can give them a little bit of help and guidance if they are um struggling um i suppose i'm going to end with saying if if um you're listening to this and, and you or anyone who's been affected by the issues that have been discussed in this podcast and 
please do head over to the Wellness at Sistra page um, where you can find a link to our employee assistance programme, uh, which contains a wealth of information to support positive mental health. Um, so thank you so much, James. <laughs>